All right, good evening, everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. And tonight I'm talking about gut bacteria, autoimmune hepatitis, and liver scarring. So uh, I hope that this will be informative. The broadcast I did a couple nights ago was just kind of a, an entry discussion into how the gut bacteria can affect liver conditions, including autoimmune hepatitis. Tonight, we're going to go a little deeper to hopefully promote understanding really of how liver cirrhosis happens, how the scarring process happens in your liver, and some research on autoimmune hepatitis relative to the gut connection. So good evening to everyone who's joining. Good evening, and thank you for chiming in. Okay, so let me put this in here. I'm going to hide that one, show this one. Hopefully do this right. Oh, I did it. <clears throat> Excellent. So this is an article from 2015. It's out of uh, China, and it's titled Abnormal Intestinal Permeability and microbiota in patients with autoimmune hepatitis. So in this article out of the International Journal of Clinical and Experimental Pathology, uh, they looked at autoimmune hepatitis patients, compared them to normal controls. As I mentioned a couple nights ago, when you're looking at autoimmune hepatitis, it's not a common condition. So frequently when you look at these articles, the sample sizes are going to be pretty small. And so, um, you know, just take that into account because it's not a common condition. So with that, they looked at these 24 patients with autoimmune hepatitis compared to the healthy controls and really looked at gut barrier integrity. They looked at their intestinal permeability. They looked at their microbiome. They looked at lipopolysaccharide. Uh, as you remember from a few nights ago, lipopolysaccharide is, think of them as the tails of gram-negative bacteria. And these tails are what elicit immune overactivation um, during a bacterial infection. So the classic example is sepsis. Uh, individuals who have sepsis, lots of times they're in the ICU, they may have an overwhelming urinary tract infection, an overwhelming pneumonia infection, and those bacteria then elicit this immune response that may be disproportionate to the infection. And as a result, the immune response is actually lots of times what ends up killing people. Sepsis is one of the most common causes of death in the hospital. So um, this is a much lesser version than sepsis, but it is along the same lines and mechanisms. So they looked at lipopolysaccharide, the initiating factor for inflammation. The lipopolysaccharide, as I mentioned, binds to the toll-like receptors, uh, toll-like 4 um, TLR receptors. So um, basically, that's what they're looking at. Now, what they ended up finding is that there was increased intestinal permeability, changes in the microbiome, and bacterial translocation in autoimmune hepatitis, which correlated with the severity of the disease. Their conclusion was that autoimmune hepatitis is associated with leaky gut. Again, I don't like that word but it is commonly used in the literature. So they said autoimmune hepatitis is associated with leaky gut and intestinal microbiome dysbiosis. The impaired intestinal barrier may play an important role in the pathogenesis of autoimmune hepatitis. So that's pretty significant. Those are some definitive statements. And again, hello to everyone who's joining. And I just love this figure. I'm going to hopefully be able to hide that guy. And then, oh boy, there we go. This figure is just fantastic because here you can see the amount of LPS, lipopolysaccharide, in their blood, and they compared those of, or the LPS levels of the healthy controls, autoimmune hepatitis, and normal liver function. So some autoimmune hepatitis patients are walking around with normal liver enzymes autoimmune hepatitis and abnormal liver function, so that's where their liver enzymes are probably high. Autoimmune hepatitis with cirrhosis, cirrhosis is scarring of the liver. Here you can see clearly that lipopolysaccharide was highest in the cirrhosis patients. 
and it had a stepwise fashion going from the healthy controls to uh, normal liver function, AIH, AIH with abnormal liver function tests, and then ultimately cirrhosis. So that's pretty significant. So if you know someone with autoimmune hepatitis, you probably want to share this information with them because there's not a ton of information about AIH out there, in my opinion. There's some, but there's not a ton. And there are a variety of theoretical and plausible mechanisms behind it, including, you know, that drug-induced liver injury may extend beyond what we call drug-induced liver injury, and maybe some AIH is due to that. Uh, there's a host of different viruses are being proposed, but the microbiome is also a leading area of research at this point in time. So that's pretty cool. So I'm going to hide this one, and then I'm going to show you this article. Okay, here I have the citation. This is from Gastroenterology Research and Practice, 2010. So here you have the citation. Now I'm going to show you the larger version of that. Okay, we'll hide that one. Okay, so here they're showing how LPS goes in through the portal vein. Now the portal vein go, is all the blood that's going from your gut to your liver. You have a liver. What would you think of your liver as being? It's like a sieve. Your liver filters toxins. So your liver is like the filter. Well, it's filtering everything coming from your intestines and colon. Most of the blood from that area of your anatomy in your gut is going to go through your liver. So the portal vein is where lipopolysaccharide is going to be uh, exported through, so to speak. The lipopolysaccharide binds to toll like receptor 4, TLR4, as I mentioned. TLR4 seems to be the key one of interest for lipopolysaccharide. Other TLRs are, are probably involved too. But the toll like receptor 4 simply activates this thing called NF kappa beta. NF kappa beta is kind of like the evil dictator of your immune system. That's initiating all these inflammatory chemokines, which then go to your comfort cells. Now your cup fur cells are like macrophages. So they're like immune defense cells specific to your liver. And then they're gonna produce this molecule called TGF beta and TGF beta then takes your hepatic stellate cells and activates them into a myofibroblast, I believe they're termed. These myofibroblasts then do what? Fibro fibrogenesis, so they lay down scar tissue. So that's the detailed explanation. There's even more details too. But just simply looking at this diagram, you can see lipopolysaccharide from the gut goes into the circulation. It activates a variety of sequences that then takes hepatic stellate cells, which should be quiescent and just kind of hanging out and doing their thing, then turning them into this, this cell that's producing a bunch of scar tissue and laying down collagen and fibrogen. And actively engaged in fibrogenesis. So pretty, pretty interesting. There's also this Bambi protein um, or this Bambi complex. Think of Bambi as being good. Bambi is trying to keep TGF beta in check. And once you have TLR4 stimulated by LPS, Bambi isn't able to do its job. And as a consequence, we get this un, unregulated, dysregulated process of scar tissue uh, going on in your liver. So Scar tissue happens when there's inflammation. You know, in the musculoskeletal world, we talk about it a lot. So if you have a major injury, you, you sprain your ankle, what do you want to do? You want to rehab the ankle. You want to strengthen the ankle along the lines of stress. Same thing you see in lower back injury patients. They injure their lower back facet joints, also known as the zygopophyseal joints. And when they have that injury, then they're going to create inflammation. And then the inflammation causes haphazard deposition of scar tissue, which is, you know, fibrinogenesis. And then this scar tissue, if it's not strengthened, if there's not some active rehab, it just is laid down haphazardly, the scar is not strong, and then people are more likely for subsequent injury. So the discussion in the liver world is whether this is inflammation in your liver from hepatitis C or hepatitis B, if this is inflammation secondary to drinking, if this is inflammation in your liver secondary to having bacterial overgrowth and having prediabetes, developing what we call non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, also known as AKA fatty liver, 
whatever the mechanism of inflammation is, this is how normal liver cells then start becoming myofibroblasts and laying down scar tissue. So that, in my opinion, is uber, uber, uber important. So take a minute, make sure you can grasp that. I think it's pretty, pretty cool uh, to see. Um, hi, this guy. I always do this. One of these times I'll get it right. That's not the article I'm looking for. Uh, hang with me. This is the one I'm looking for. Okay. Um, we're going to go back here. Behind that one. Okay, we got it. All right. So this is uh, from Frontiers in Immunology. It's just more verification of what I'm talking about, the role of toll-like receptors in immune activation and tolerance and tolerance in the liver. TLRs are a family of pattern recognition receptors. Uh, so they're trying to recognize yourself versus bacterial antigens. You know, that liver is a sieve, it's a filter, so it's going to see bacterial DNA coming through, it's going to see lipopolysaccharide. The key thing is that we want the liver in balance. We don't want too many TLRs getting stimulated, causing excessive immune activation and deposition of, you know, fibrous collagen. So TLRs are expressed on comfort cells, as I mentioned, dendritic cells, other types of immune cells, hepatic stellate cells, endothelial cells, and hepatocytes in the liver. So these TLRs are expressed throughout the liver, and that's important for you to know. And they go on in this article to basically summarize everything I just mentioned. So um, let's hide this guy. So if you have any questions on this, uh, please let me know. And I hope this also was helpful. Uh, I'm trying to kind of take you through steps in liver pathology relative to the gut bacterial connection. And, um, and we'll probably go deeper and deeper. We'll talk about some antibody testing with autoimmune hepatitis. We still haven't covered uh, fatty liver in great detail. I really want to talk about hepatic encephalopathy, how liver conditions can affect the brain. And, and yeah, so there's still more to discuss, but I think this is exciting. And let me know if you have any other thoughts. Okay, you all have a good night and I will see you soon.